Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Stan Grad. We're coming to you live from Sydney tonight. Joining me on the panel, satirist and entertainer Paul McDermott, writer, actor and director Nakia Louie, founding artistic director of Bell Shakespeare, John Bell, author, academic and activist Bree Lee, and philosopher and author Tim Dean. Wonderful to have you all here in the room. This question is particularly directed to Mr John Bell, but also all of the as members of the Mark Wall High School's Shakespeare Club, we are interested in the power and appeal of Shakespeare and his works and their influence today. How do you think Shakespeare's themes and influence still resonate with our contemporary society? And what are your views on why or whether Shakespeare remains relevant to study in schools? And what makes Shakespeare so popular and lasting compared to other early modern playwrights like Christopher Marlowe? John, I know the question was directed to you, but I'll get you to hold the <laughs> thought, Nakia. Oh, well, I would go to... I'd go to Mr. Bell <laughs> a little bit in theatre or as a nerdy That's playwright. A <laughs> um, no, but I think, you know, you know, the man's still being produced after 400 years. That's quite the career. Um, this is my <laughs> second um, panel on Q&A talking about Shakespeare. So I think the question about whether or not Shakespeare is relevant, I think that's a resounding yes. yes. 400, over 400 do years you, has proven the man wonder, is relevant. Do you wonder sometimes what Shakespeare would be thinking... 400 years later, they're still talking about me. <laughs> I was wondering about that. Uh, I think the question we should be asking is why are we asking if Shakespeare is relevant? And in an age where we're discussing new ideas and hearing from voices that have been traditionally, historically not embraced and marginalised, what are we hoping to seek by looking mm. at the work of Shakespeare and not new voices? Yeah. Um, that's something I ponder about. And uh, given that Shakespeare's, you know, he had such imagination, uh, he was obsessed with new ideas, uh, dissecting power structures and culture, would Shakespeare be saying, hey, stop studying me, on, take guys. a chance on a brand new kid or well, we're something? Gonna, we're going to get to that. Uh, John, let's go back a bit. And what was it about Shakespeare that grabbed you and when? I was about 13 years old, I think, and listening to the ABC radio um, and uh, hearing Ron Hedrick playing Brutus in Julius Caesar. Um, I had never heard Shakespeare before, and that grabbed my attention. Uh, the extraordinary voice and uh, the imagery that was, you know, coming to me. And then in high school, I had two wonderful English teachers, two wonderful uh, men who knew they loved literature, poetry, Shakespeare in particular, and they really, uh, you know, loved the, the work so much that it really inspired something in me, and I wanted to get up on stage and speak those words. So it was, uh, I think, a great teacher uh, will not only inspire you, but actually set, can set your life's course, mm -hmm. as those two men did for me, and I'm eternally grateful for that. Paul, I understand you had a, a, a more painful experience of an introduction to Shakespeare in high school. Is that oh, right? We're we going there, are we? Are we going there? <laughs> All right. <I'll> look, <laughs> we've, uh, done it. we've done our research, Paul. <laughs> uh, this was a chat I was having with someone, and um, it's interesting that it's come up, but certainly uh, when I was in... Uh, I think it was year eight, could have been year nine... Um, we were reading Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. and we were told by the teacher uh, to go outside uh, into nature and, and read the book out, uh, you know, in one of the fields, paddocks around our schools or on the Oval or something. I, I don't know why that was. I don't know if it was so we could commune with the elements and get a deeper understanding of it, but we were on the, on the Oval. I was there with a couple of mates, and, and they were... You know, they were friends of mine, I consider them friends, but at one stage, uh, two of them grabbed my legs and, and splayed me across, uh, across this small uh, little uh, hill that we were sitting on. And uh, another friend of mine uh, looked at his copy of Julius, Shakes, of Julius Caesar and, uh, and, and flung it at my groin at speed and, uh, and, and cracked me on the nuts with Julius Caesar, <laughs> Julius Caesar's spine. And I don't think I ever finished the book after that. It was so... But you've never forgotten Shakespeare. I've never forgotten yeah. <laughs> Shakespeare's spine. <laughs> Tim, stays with me. One of the one of the things about Shakespeare, of course, is that he's one of those people credited with. Harold Bloom said this, didn't he? That the great, the great critic that he invented the modern human, if you like, that he's part of the invention of modernity. And as a philosopher, what do you draw from him? Look, I, I don't know if he invented the modern human, but I think he does speak to something about human nature. I mean, that's what I'm interested in. And when I, you know, read or watch Shakespeare, I see those elements of human nature there. But he's also... He's talking from a, a kind of a particular period in, in, in kind of history. And I think there's not as much universality there as we might think. We think about, like, modernity or we think about, um, you know, the... the 
the, the way that humans have been over the last few hundred years. But we've got to remember, we are a species that is hundreds of thousands of years mm. old. Now, he does tap into some aspects of the human uh, condition that are timeless, but there is still, there's a lot that he is, is missing out. He did touch on something that I think emerged from that kind of agricultural, large-scale living, the concentration of the resources, the inequality, the power structures. Um, some of those kinds of elements there, I think, are very, very rich there. But I don't know if it's quite mm. universal. Brie, um, John's made this point, um, and uh, Tim says there, might, there are things that are left out. There's a hell of a lot of society before Shakespeare um, picks up a pen. But it was an extraordinary range of work, wasn't it? The breadth and depth of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are two separate arguments here. One is the sort of out in the real world where I believe that good art can foster a, a further desire and hunger for more good art. And then there is the educational setting where it's very much a zero sum game. So what do I mean by that? If we go see paintings that move us or if we go see theatre that makes us laugh and cry, we're more likely to go to more exhibitions. We're more likely to go out and buy more tickets to more plays. The thing that concerns me and to sort of pick up where Nakia just left off, is that for every single time you fight for the inclusion of one of Shakespeare's plays to be taught, that is fighting for the exclusion of a Anne Truly King or a Kate Mulvaney or a Nakia Louie play. Mm. There are only a certain number of semesters and a certain number of texts that students can be taught every year. Australia, much like the United States, has reached a moment in which to be proud of being Australian or to show any spark of patriotism is seen as alt-right. How are we going to move on and improve the lives of all citizens, regardless of their backgrounds, if we are not united by a positive sense of self? Paul, it's an interesting question from Zoe, but do you accept the premise that, that um, to express patriotism is to belong to the alt-right? Is there a place for patriotism that is not hijacked? I, by think, a particular I think there's extent? a lovely aspect of love of country, but when it turns into a nationalistic sort of fervour or it's... Uh, and, and often with, uh, with patriotism, I've always sort of been a, a person that's been offended by, the, by people wrapping the Australian flag around themselves. I, I don't know why that is. I just find it a bit of a statement. Would, would um, you feel comfortable to say, um, I'm a proud Australian? I'm a proud Australian, mm. yeah. And I think we have a, a gift of a country here. It's an extraordinary country. And, um, uh, but, of course, there are, there are the dark forces that are moving within this country at the moment. And um, I think there's been massive influence uh, from America over the past, uh, you know, five, uh, ten years. Um, and we do have a, a growing problem. But it's not just in Australia. It's globally uh, with the alt-right. Uh, and um, I, I find them un unbearable because they don't, uh, they don't allow... Uh, they don't allow thoughts um, uh, and they're not comfortable with, uh, with differing opinions. So it's a, a very belligerent um, and aggressive tone that I think a lot of the alt-right adopt with people. Nakia, we, you know, we've been talking a lot about the critique of, of the West and the baggage of the West. And I was just wondering if... What are the things about the West that inspire you, that you're proud of and that are worth, worth pers uh, preserving? Stan, I'm not answering that question. Like, that's... that's I, I don't think that the West is at any risk at all of anyone because a few people get up and criticise some of its great works of art and go, hey, this is a little bit offensive. I feel rather marginalised and I don't feel like I have a place in this society. Maybe, maybe we should, uh, like, uh, reconsider whether you... Like, how we look at this work. Um, I, I just... I don't think that that's... I, I think that that creation... That, that question is, is quite divisive. But, but, we live but... in the West every single day. And, and speaking of what you're saying, Paul, you know, would I call myself a proud Australian? I'd call myself a proud First Nations person. I'm on land that was never ceded. This land is not a gift. It was land that was stolen because homes were destroyed and people were killed. So gift from the West, I, I don't know what you want me to say to that other than no. be like, hey, oh, you know, it wasn't so bad that invasion happened. However, in saying that, going to the question that was asked by that young lady in terms of, uh, I think so often we look at our backgrounds as being a hindrance to some type of equality, and that in order to be a good Australian, you have to forget about your things like your, your gender, your race, your culture. Anything that makes you different is somehow an obstacle obstacle to being a good Australian. So I would question when we go, oh, the spirit of, of nationalism, what is that nationalism? Who does that person look like that we're all meant to be celebrating and replicating? 
That's, but I'm not going to answer what I think is great about the West. But That's like being like, oh, well, you're lucky we gave you iPads. But it's not, Look at it's you on your what, Facebook with your descent. No, what, I'm not, not answering. It's not what's great about the West. But to go to Bree's point about holding two views at the same time, is it a fact that a, a Western tradition that is complicit in empire and colonisation and genocide and the things you've talked about is also uh, something that has created liberalism, democracy, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. Are those things but not worth preserving? But they created it, though? The question is, I wouldn't say we're trying to... I wouldn't say that people are trying to stop freedom of speech because we are wanting to engage with our freedom of speech. You can't, on one hand, go, oh, there's a whole marketplace of ideas, and then when some people then use whatever platform they have to argue with those ideas go oh well the marketplace is rigged and you're cancelling us that isn't fair and I don't think that you know this idea of modern history um, democracy it's it's the names that we are uh, freedom of speech are these 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 this inheritance of Western culture that does a real disservice to all of the cultures that weren't impacted by the West and what preceded them you know I think that like within Aboriginal culture there's that's that's a big generalisation. So I'm sorry to probably my parents who I offended saying that. But you look at all the different tribes, all the different nations. Mm. They all have their own values. So to think that thought originated from one particular race at one particular time is is so incredibly ignorant to me. But I, I don't. I of course I think people are capable of duality. I think more than any time where we're wanting to, especially, you know, with the pandemic that hit, our capacity for empathy, our capacity to want to get to know our neighbour, just because we get upset at each other and we have dissenting opinions doesn't mean we're not capable of thought or we aren't well-fleshed-out human beings. Like, that, that is, like, I just find that question really, like, that's a little bit divisive. And, and that goes to your book, actually, Tim, doesn't it? Because you're talking about how we have just these types of conversations with all of the historical legacy, um, with all of the contradiction, um, with the philosophical thought that gave birth to this that is problematic, as you've already pointed out. So how do we do this? I think this is a good example of how we do this. We sit and listen to each other. But what makes it really difficult is we can hold two ideas at once, but it's, we're not very good at it. Um, we're much better at holding one idea. And not only just holding one idea, we're much better at holding an idea that others someone. So we've got a, a negative who we can push back against. And that can kind of help reinforce and buttress our identity. And, I mean, talking about, like, the marketplace of ideas, I, I used to really be believer in the marketplace of ideas, right? I used to <laughs> teach critical thinking and, <laughs> hey, everyone, if we can just do some better Venn diagrams, we can have some better conversations like this. And I realised it wasn't working because all I was doing, I was... They were, the students were weaponising this stuff to have bad conversations, to have bad arguments by throwing fallacies in people's place, pace, faces or, or finding a way to, to kind of bring them down and win an argument. And I think what I've learnt a lot in the last few years and particularly through writing the book and looking at human nature and looking at how we create our identities and how we... Um, how identity is so much socially constructed and how we create these others and the difficulties of us kind of getting out of some of that um, in-group, out-group kind of thinking is we also really need to figure out how to listen better and listen better in a way that can validate and genuinely understand how someone feels. And this is, this is a journey for me, right, mm. because I don't experience discrimination. I'm, I'm kind of right bang in the middle of privilege. So I've learned a lot by actually listening a lot more and understanding those feelings. And that's a separate conversation to... Um, the content and the theories and the arguments and the and the facts and all that kind of thing. But we've got to get better at that listening phase because I think what that does, the foundation of any good disagreement is social capital. Trust and respect mm. and affection and the glue that can bind us together and the bridges that we can build between communities. And so when I teach critical thinking now, I don't talk about this kind of marketplace of ideas thing where we've just got to put out better arguments. I talk about how to listen better, how to hear people, how to validate feelings, how to build that trust, how to express a little bit of vulnerability, to go on a journey together to understand something mm. rather than just trying to, to win an argument. What about when people aren't coming? It seems like what you're saying completely... like very insightful, completely agree. But what if... The, it seems like it's on the assumption that people are coming from the same... like a same place of equity. Mm. Or good faith. Yeah, in good faith. Yeah. Well, yeah. How do you like? How do you respond to when like people have different amounts of equity? You know, like how how does that? You know, what's a bad argument in a context where people are necessarily maybe 
not being heard and don't have the power to be heard. Look at the Black Lives Matter movement. Well, you know what changed my mind about the marketplace of ideas was... Oh, I, was I just threw that out there. When I started... Not, well, it, yeah, it, it featured not, a lot uh, in my more naive kind of philosophical I do thinking. I believe in that. Um, Is when I really started to factor in power and how power changes things, and that's what you're talking about in terms of equity and different voices and marginalisation. And suddenly all of that work that philosophers have done for thousands of years trying to get to the moral truth suddenly just looks hollow because where were they coming Tim, from? Where, Tim, what Tim, positions did they have? What Tim, power did they have? Can I, can I just come in and just, just to bring it back to Zoe's question yeah. and uh, the implication of that question that somehow it is wrong to express a patriotism. Um, the ideas that you're talking about, that the, the plurality of ideas and the ability to have discussion, is that not rooted in just the type of thinkers you were talking about before, the David Humes of the world, the Enlightenment thinkers? Is that not a Western inheritance? Yeah, there's, there's an element where, um, for most of human history, you were born into a moral community and you didn't choose. You didn't get to choose your social role, you didn't get to choose your power, um, you didn't get to choose what you agreed with and disagreed with and liked. And there have been varying degrees in some communities of allowing diversity, but really the, 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 the push through liberalism, the push through John Locke and people like that was to say, we are now at a scale of society where big groups are bumping into each other with different views and they're killing each other over it. I mean, people have been killing each other over these things for a long time, but the scale of it was so, was so great. We need some different ways of thinking about this. Their way of thinking wasn't perfect, but what it did do is introduce mm. an idea of diversity and tolerance as being a norm rather than eliminating diversity and tolerance. And hence, we can have this conversation. Much has been said about the toxicity of Twitter. But isn't it just filling the vacuum that has been left through the absence of an effective fourth estate holding our leaders to account following the changes in media ownership laws? Mm. Aren't memes just the political cartoons and citizen reporters just the investigative journalists of the modern era? Yeah, Paul, it's certainly we're living in an era where someone with a phone can be a, a filmmaker, a photographer, someone with a blog can be a journalist. Um, and, and the democratisation of voices, while it's a, it can be a rough space, we're hearing from a lot of people that we didn't hear from before. Well, that's very true, and I, I think some of them, most of them, we shouldn't be hearing from. <laughs> um, it, it, yeah, it gets overwhelming. At the moment, there's a, an incredible tirade uh, that's happening with uh, David Chappelle and uh, Hannah Gadsby. Whether Dave Chappelle should be cancelled. He'd said some things about Hannah Gadsby not particularly being funny, I think, was one well, of the said references. He said he wasn't funny, which is, a, which is an old trope about women, and it's, it's incredibly offensive. Hannah is an extraordinary writer. I think we should be uh, proud of, uh, of her and her work. Nanette was a global sensation. Um, but, but comedy, like, like all the arts we're talking about, it's very subjective. You like what you like and certain people don't. And, and having one of the most powerful male comics in the world sort of punching, punching down at Hannah, I think, is, is phenomenal. And that has, that has awoken all these people on Twitter who are agreeing with him. Not a lot of uh, comedians, I've noticed, or, or people that actually know her work. A lot of it is just, uh, uh, just people attacking, and, and it's pretty vile. But, uh, but he's given it air and it will keep going for quite some time. Is this... Tim, are you familiar with the, the Dave Chappelle furor at the moment? And I, I've avoided it um, avoided as much <laughs> as I can. I mean, yes, I'm familiar with it because it's everywhere, but is, I've, is I've... it someone being an agent provocateur, do you think? Is it deliberately... Is, is he trying to make a point about... How far can I go before I get Look, cancelled I, I to make a point about cancel I can't comment cancel on, his, on his particular thing because I've only got enough bandwidth <laughs> and so I, I pick I pick my Twitter battles to follow, and that one I, I chose not to. I've, I've been following many other things. But I think these kinds of... It's not just them talking, it's, it's millions of other people talking. And that's what's changed now. That's what's changed with social media. And as Paul said, maybe a lot of those people we shouldn't be speaking of. Now, I don't know how you would measure it, but I'd suggest that, that like, Twitter is probably a net loss for humanity. Um, for the good things that it's enabled, for the for the democratisation, for the uh, the revolutions perhaps that it's influenced, I think there's been so much toxic discourse that's been put on there. And part of that is because it's built in a way to push our brain's buttons, to feed our desire for outrage well, you, you, and You say we're addicted to outrage. We are addicted, yeah. yeah. We're addicted to it. We, so I talk a lot about, like, the way we evolved and, like, you know, we've got, like, a sweet tooth and we can blame our primates for that. And that probably wasn't so bad, our primate ancestors for that, but it wasn't so bad for them. It was really hard for them to get obese. But we're now in an environment surrounded 
buy sweet treats. It's really hard. We have to stop ourselves, and we're not very good at using willpower to stop it. I don't it. often do that, I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, and you, but the same thing has occurred with outrage. Outrage is a very powerful moral emotion that encourages us to call out wrongdoing and intervene and stop it. But when it's on social media, we are flooded with a torrent of outrageous events. Uh and we don't have... It, it pushes our buttons, but we don't have the same means to actually do anything positive about it. Bria, are we, are we flooded by it, or do it, does it seem like it? Do we hear... Is it so loud, the anger on there, that we hear... That we, don't, that we miss everything else that's happening, and we miss the voices that are being heard that don't always get heard? We miss the civility. We miss the genuine conversation because it is drowned out by what may be at the extremes a lot of the noise. I wonder about that. I think the power of the internet to allow previously disempowered and disenfranchised individuals to collectivise is something that we can not afford to underestimate, ever. What I believe is that there is an overdue conversation about the toxicity of something like, let's use Twitter specifically, but also social media more generally. Yes, individuals behave in a toxic way towards each other. I'm much more interested in asking who are the multi-billionaires mm. who create toxic environments to foster the worst in us. And the evidence that's coming out, especially mm. in America at the moment, in the Senate, uh, Senate... Facebook. Uh, yeah, about Facebook. And the fact that it is a... It's not an accidental or unfortunate byproduct of Facebook that people get toxic with each other. That is a core component of the way it operates. The toxicity for young people, young women in particular, but young people in general about body image and the use of Instagram, that's not an accidental, unfortunate byproduct. That is a part of the modus operandi of these huge businesses that make a small number of people an extreme amount of money. If we're going to talk about toxicity of social media, let's actually pick the big guys up mm. top instead of taking each other down. Yeah, like outrage has been commodified. I don't necessarily think we've been addicted to it because I think if mm. you're from a marginalised community, you have a lot to be outraged by. And things aren't like, like social media, the solidarity and the voice that you can find there is a really good tool in order to create change. And we've seen that through things like the solidarity around the world with Black Lives Matter. And then when we say it's toxic, it's toxic to who? Because I just want to say, in speaking, you know, you talked about Dave Chappelle and being like, has Dave Chappelle been cancelled? Dave Chappelle is a very rich man who got paid to do that Netflix comedy, mm. talking about trans people. Now, we talk about, you know, like, the what is the ramifications in real life? Is it cancelling or is it just accountability? Is it accountability? Yeah. Because, essentially, he was punching down on trans people. There are... The most vulnerable trans people are trans people of colour. Our brothers and sisters stand, who he was punching down on. So who cares if he's cancelled? Who cares if the discourse around him is toxic? Because people... The people who actually have to, to, to live the ramifications of, of that type of hate speech, like, that's mm. inequality. And actually, the only person I'm aware of that's actually been cancelled in terms of losing their job, wasn't it a trans-identifying person who worked at Netflix who leaked the documents to try and bring attention mm. to mm. the situation? N Nikia, you, you found yourself in a situation recently, didn't you? And I want to just ex explore this and the, the, the sequence of events with the, the, um, the Pauline Hanson interview um, done by Jessica Rowe, and I believe you were one of... The, a few people who had said, you know, who, who had, who had criticised that, that was subsequently taken down. But then what happened afterwards? So I had a conversation with... Um, <laughs> it was really funny because about, like, a week earlier, I'd had, like, a few ones and been like, I'm taking down my Twitter because <laughs> I haven't been on for ages because I do think, in a way, it, it, like, for, for myself, as someone with a platform, it is really... It can be a really toxic place mm. to be, but it has its value. So when we go, oh, we don't want to throw great out at, like, the baby out with the bathwater, the same can be said for social media. I think we throw these buzzwords around, like, toxic, and it's like, what does it actually mean? What is the lived reality of, of people engaging with these mediums? But how that kind of went down is... Um, uh, Jessica Rowe is a very dear... Uh, very, like, a friend of mine, mm -hmm. someone who I very much respect. I did a podcast with Pauline Hanson. Um, they, there was a lot of uh, criticism online, so I thought, OK... I wrote one tweet, I think it was two tweets, uh, very, you know, f for me, I thought it was fairly um, calm and uh, articulate. Um, I just said, look, I, I don't know if this is necessarily what you... What, do you want to associate yourself did, with this? Did you want her to take it I down? suggest... No, I said, it's up to you. I, like, I said, was like, maybe you take it down, but really it's up to you. But here, here is my opinion. Let's have a discourse about it. 
Anyway, um, Jess ended up taking, making the decision to take the podcast down, which was her uh, decision. Um, but then what ensued was that outrage commodification. It was, I was, it was on the news. There were, it, it may, mainly, I, I'm like getting nervous even talking about this because I don't know what the onslaught's going to be. Um, the, you know, I guess more conservative right-wing media. Um, for two tweets, I really thought like out of everything that I've done in my career, that would be the least, <laughs> a kind of um, thing that would get attention. Um, yeah, and I had people send me messages. I can pull out my phone and read some of them. You get caught an abo, an idiot, a piece of shit. That was one of the, that's what I've like, that's that, that's that, like, um, that's that kind of outrage commodification. I did not expect it. Um, and it really, it really took me by surprise. And, and um, people and, accusing you of also engaged of in censorship, yeah. and it's like I didn't like it. But did, we, did Pauline Hanson just? Well, I think what we need to remember you, though is censorship is something Hansen that's have... done by a government. I think we're allowed to go, hey, you did something, I don't agree. Also, that's not censorship. You can't. That's just someone disagreeing did, with did, you. And did, I think out of all people, Pauline Hanson hmm. should be, you know, the the leniency she takes over people's rights. She should be. The, the words she throws at other people, she but, should be. But able you to weren't saying take it down. You'd been happy for. I it suggested. To, I said to maybe you should, but it's up to you. Um, but what ended up happening was, and this is what I want to go to cancel culture, the way we use this in outrage, as if these are new things. I sat in the shower one morning and I was crying because I'd been getting these messages saying that was worthless, I should kill myself, all these things. And I sat in my shower, I'm, you know, I'm in my 30s, I'm a fairly privileged person, and I cried. I didn't want to exist. I've struggled with self-harm and depression my entire life. You know, from when kids would call me, uh, call me the fat abo and throw their fruit at me off the bus at school. And I sat there, and what I did is I went on social media and I just started writing um, because, you know, this is like, this is the only thing I could do is, is this is this is my voice, you're not going to take it away. And I don't know, and the, the response I got was was really overwhelming and, and it, you know, it, it, if I hadn't gone to social media, I wouldn't have gotten that response. But then I thought, hey, like, these feelings are feeling worthless of people calling you names. These aren't new, Nakia. Mm. I spoke to my parents. I'm sure you have as well, Stan. They've also had those things. They've said to me, my mum has said to me, a woman in her 60s who has had a rich career, amazing person, she said, sometimes I feel worthless as an Aboriginal person in this country and I too have thought about self-harm. So this thing of, like, outrage and cancel culture, cancel culture exists because we live in a colonial nation that is built on cancelling people. It's just we're going... I think what we do is we see marginal people and we call them a cultural problem when they dare to say anything back. Well, mm. they, those things don't define you and I think you, you know that. Um, and, you know, those, those people don't. Don't define well, you. Well, to an extent, though, you they, they do. That is, to an extent, I don't... I'm the only person here on the Q&A website where they have my... Oh, maybe except for you, sorry, Stan. Um, where, on this panel today, they said, a Gomorrah Torres Strait Islander woman. I'm not ashamed of being Aboriginal, but we're defined mm -hmm. by colonial people, by whiteness, telling us that we're Aboriginal. We don't call, no. you know, white <laughs> Mr John Bell. Um, <laughs> I can if you like. Thank but you. Um, <laughs> it's like, why... So this idea that we get to pick in and out of these things that define us, it's... I don't think it's necessary necessarily correct, gives us way more autonomy then. I, I, I might just finish with you, yeah, Paul. Sorry. Um, no, no, th thank you. <laughs> thank sorry. you, Nikia. I, I, I might just speak to you, Paul, just as someone who's, who's a satirist as well. Um, how, do you, how do you navigate that line between what is outrage, what is genuinely a cause of outrage and, and rightful outrage, and what is toxic, what is hateful? I've, I've never experienced anything uh, like what Nikia is talking about. I'm, I'm once again, a, you know, an example of, of privilege. I've had a, you know, extraordinary easy run through life. Um, so, uh, as uh, as someone gets, I get up on stage. I don't feel terrified of speaking my mind when I'm on stage. I don't worry if I upset people. But I don't come from a different, you know, culture. Um, so. Uh, I just I just do what I do, but it's it's very different for for other people on the you know in this in this group, um, and uh, we all we all approach it differently. We all try and overcome. We all try and express <coughs> our art, and expressing art and sharing it is what I think we're all trying to do, and trying to get to a, a better point with uh, with humanity, all of humanity, even the even the people that are a bit yeah. 
<laughs> like, for instance, like this is really this. I think it was on it was a column by Bolt, I think, where he quoted a role that Dead Melbourne plays in the ABC TV show Total Control. Mm. And instead of saying that the character said this 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 quote, he said it as Dead Mailman said that quote. That's very clearly taken out of context. That's happened to me, where I've been in comedy sketches, and the stuff that I've said mm. is accounted attributed to me as saying Rather that. Rather than so that, performance or as role. As a performance. And, and that's what I mean. I think there needs to be a lot of accountability to the media companies who are commodifying that outrage and being able to create division and not allow people. We're talking a lot about duality and complexity to people. I think, you know, we, we really still are fighting for that, a lot of a lot of people. As I say, thanks again to our panel, Paul McDermott, Akia Louie, John Bell, Bree Lee and Tim Dean. Remember, you can hear John Bell's Boyer Lectures every Sunday in November. That's on ABCRN and via the ABC. BC Listen at.